Um, it's the first time I'm speaking in this time of uh, forum, and uh, I hope I uh, do a good job of uh, showing you the data and explaining without uh, going into jargon and so on. If I don't, please raise your hand and tell me that I have. Uh, <laughs> I need to explain myself. Um, I don't normally think about this. Uh, issues on a regular basis, although in some ways I do. And so this has been a very uh, interesting experience to me to sort of review my uh, uh, life as a scientist in, under this uh, particular uh, lens. So what I'm going to talk about today is um, incidents where uh, irreproducibility actually uh, proved to be uh, new data or hiding data or uh, some other aspect in, in the um, scientific or in the experimental system that we were not really considering when we set up the experiment. And um, I don't think it's a flaw science. I think it's, it's part of science, and it's something that we need to recognize and something that we need to pay attention to when we uh, perform experiments. Um, so I work on protein folding and protein folding diseases, which are also associated with aging. And I do that. And I put the question in the context of uh, multicellular organisms. And there are all kinds of models, system to look at uh, multicellular organism. And the are many advantages of using such models when you do research. The only problem, or let's say that, one of the main problems of working with multicellular organism is that the complexity of the question and problems that you're facing is sometimes uh, very high. And a lot of time, you treat the, the, the experimental system as a black box, and the things that comes out of it are not always very clear. So I work with C. elegans. It's one of the simplest uh, model organism. And it's great in a sense that it has a lot of advantages that we can use, specifically if you consider reproducibility. So first, they are highly conservative, reproducible animals, me meaning that you can trace each and every cell in the adult animals, and you can know exactly the lineage of where it came from. So we know we can track each cell division, and we know that this particular neuron came from this cell, from this cell, from this cell, all the way to the first division of cells in the egg. Okay? So this is a great model for developmental biologists because you can predict what a cell will be in the next uh, division, and so you can learn a lot about uh, uh, developmental biology. It is also a very good model for aging. They live short time, and uh, the uh, best advantage is that they are hermaphrodite, meaning that you put one worm, you get 200 worms uh, three or four days later, depending on the temperature, and those are supposed to be genetically identical. Okay, I insist on supposed to be, but they are, uh, for the most part, the most genetically identical model, meaning that you can take this population and treat it as a different, uh, or as an experiment that repeats on the same population. So you do biological repeats, but it, it's supposedly the same animal, reducing a lot of the variability that's associated with uh, other strains where you have to take a male and a female in order to get a population, and you introduce genetic variability just by that. And one more advantage, if we are talking about it, it's transparent. And so that means that we can look inside and look at living animals and see exactly or follow what's going on inside there. So when we work in this model system, and I think it's probably, or I assume it's a general concept when people working with a model system, is that you can work at different hierarchies or levels of complexity. And each level can give you different things in terms of what you're trying to do from there or get from the experience. So um, the first level is the organismal level, mainly and majorly by uh, behavioral assay where we take the worm or whatever animal it is, and we check what is, uh, what is happening to the worms. And uh, Cindy Brenner that introduced uh, the C. elegans actually brought it into, uh, into the lab because it is a, an extremely uh, simple model where you can take a gene and translate into a function or um, a phenotype. And that gene phenotype connection can allow you to solve the problem of what a gene Phenotype, gene, phenotypes. In fact, if you look at the gene in C. elegans, most of them are named by the phenotype that they're showing. Uncoordination, dumpy, long, age, so on, and you will see some examples. 
Um, and so behavior is a very strong, it's a very strong um, assay or behavioral assays are very strong um, experimental approach because they allow us to do a sweep and very quick way of looking at the system and finding interesting phenotype or interesting questions we want to follow. But it's a black box. We don't know even we, if we assume what exactly is giving us the phenotype and underlying uh, mechanism that might impact that phenotype. And a lot of variability and irreproducibility, as I will show you, come from that. The second level is the cellular level, where we look at protein or uh, cell component using various techniques of staining or microscopy, where we're actually trying to understand which tissue is showing uh, uh, which phenotype and um, to understand the organization of the um, protein in space or where they are doing or where they are doing their, their work. And the final one is that we can always treat the C. elegans or uh, the, the, sadly, as tubes that contains micromolecules which we can purify and then um, study. So we can study the proteins, we can study the RNA, uh, fatty acid component, and we can ask about their level, their uh, composition, and so on. So we usually, so this is an example, I will come back to this example because uh, uh, it's one of the uh, examples I want to show. Uh, but this is an example of how you can sort of see this principle in action. So we uh, looked or we, we knew that a protein folding environment change when uh, the animal is aged, aging. We all know that the system deteriorates with age. And so I wanted to do an experiment to ask when the change occur. And so I used a simple assay of surviving stress, okay? A stress response is an, a, is an acute response and it uh, requires a lot of quality control and surviving the stress is a good indication of the quality control networks actually working properly, okay? So it's a very simple experiment where every day you take similar animals, not the same animals, expose them to similar stress and ask how many survive. And you can see that the first day of adulthood, all animals survive. But to our surprise, already on the second day of adulthood, this pattern changed, and we saw what now called in the literature collapse of proteostasis, okay? Uh, change, dramatic change in the ability to activate the stress response. As you can see in this work, we also find mutants that don't do that. They are very interesting because they are associated with the reproduction system, but a particular aspect of the reproduction system. I will not go into that. So this is on the organism level. Then going into the uh, uh, cellular level, we can use a reporter, this is a fluorescent protein, that is under the regulation, the genetic regulation of the heat shock response. And we ask whether or not it is changing the expression. And we can see that on the first day of adulthood, you get a heat shock response, this protein is produced. But on the third day, it is not. And our mutant correct this change. Okay, the last, is we can take the worms, we can purify the RNA or protein, but this is RNA, and ask whether or not RNA level change. And you can see that the wild type RNA levels drop dramatically, but our mutant stays uh, or show similar, similar uh, levels. So this is basically allowing you in some ways to do reproducible experiment, but using very different techniques and different levels of uh, interrogation in order to actually say that this is what you're looking at and not just uh, uh, something random. But even when doing this, things can, can be uh, affected. And uh, what I want to do today is show you several examples, these experiments, but also a few others and some from the literature, where sometimes it is reproducibility, sometimes it is variability. And I think if I want you to take some message from, from this work is that um, Complex systems have a lot of layers that you have to pay attention to. And in those, uh, in those uh, layers, there could be hiding either new truth or really flaws, <laughs> big, big flaws and failures. So you have to pay attention. <laughs> I'm going to go uh, and give example to environmental factors that can contribute to this. And I will talk on genetic factors. Uh, um, and I'll give more example here because some of the genetic factors are hidden because we don't really see, the animals doesn't go with a, like a, a note saying, this is my genetic profile. We're sort of guessing it, and a lot of failures come here. Okay, so 
this is almost the first experiment that was done in my uh, lab here in Ben Gurion University. I was a, a new researcher, and we did this experiment, and we saw this collapse, and we were extremely uh, excited. I mean, you know, it's like the first day of adulthood, it's changing, it's changing within hours, you get this collapse. It's not like a mild effect, it's like 80% change, very robust, very exciting, okay? And we already had the mutant that rescues this, so this, this concept was highly exciting. I actually uh, asked my student to sit down and appreciate the moment where her theory was actually correct, because it doesn't really happen in science very often, where you have an hypothesis and you're proven right. Um, so, but uh, my, my student got really excited, and uh, because as we were told here, every experiments have to be repeated, and have to be repeated rigorously, I sent her to redo the experiments and, and come back with their result. And as it is, she comes back a few days later and tells me that it's not reproducible. Meaning she sees the phenotype, but then she repeated the experiments and the phenotype is completely gone, the worms behave completely like uh, the, white, uh, the, the, the first day of adulthood, and there is no collapse of proteostasis. I'm a firm believer that if you see something and it's substantial, it's usually there. <laughs> I say usually, and so one of the things that I've asked her to do is let's go and look at the raw data and see if we can find something that can explain this, uh, this be behavior. And this is what we noticed, and, and you can see it summarized here. When she had experiments where she was using small amount of worms, she saw the phenotype. And when she did the experiments with a lot of worms, the phenotype was gone. Okay, so now you can look at this data. <laughs> And you can say, okay, something is really, really awful here. Obviously, it's not reproducible. Something is weird. Or you can say maybe there is something here that we are not considering. And looking at the data, we could think about two things that can play a role. One is the crowd, crowdness itself. It's known in C. elegans that when they are too crowded, there is a hormone. They can tell other worms, it's too crowded here. Let's go somewhere else. Okay. And the other thing is that plates that had a lot of worms also have very little food. They still have food, but they had much less food. Studying crowdness in this particular point was not very simple. You had to uh, produce the hormone. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't a simple procedure. So we decided to test the first hypothesis and see, uh, the second hypothesis of whether or not uh, the amount of food is impacting our, our research. And yes, it did. So if we took the worms and removed them completely from food, so now there is no food, and we checked their survival over time, we could see that there was an increase in survival, and it sort of saturated around four, six hours, where you got 80% survival, exactly like the wild type, okay, under this experimental condition. Meaning that the lack of food, or change in food amount, at least, changed or reshaped this, um, this uh, phenotype. So, of course, now we repeat the experiments, carefully controlling the food, and everything is fine, and we published it. And we are also very careful to report that the number of worms have to be careful, carefully monitored and the, number, and the amount of food needs to be carefully uh, monitored because the amount of food impact the experiments. I hope people read methods. I do, but uh, <laughs> this is where it is. But we also took it a step further. We actually went into this because we find it an interesting biology. And then we took a mutant that has a defective pharynx, meaning that when it eats, it's actually it's not managing to grind the food very well. And so it can sit in a pile of bacteria, be very happy with a lot of food, but actually get very little food inside. And so in this case, we give them the same amount of food, but their ability to introduce the food inside change, and we can get the same, uh, same thing again. So uh, this is rescuing, and lack of food is rescuing. And we, we have went on to publish that dietary restriction and dietary manipulation can actually also change its phenotype. And it's changed it in a different way than the reproduction signal. So they are not overlapping. They are doing different things. And if you put both of them together, you get even bigger change in some aspect and uh, less in other. And it's reshaping the environment, which basically means that you can take this quality control system and change it in many different ways. And it's not just one or two. And it's very important to our interpretation, and especially if you want to go in the end to medical sciences and change and affect uh, uh, protein bisphotic diseases. Uh, I told you, we always do it properly, or we try to do it properly. So we, we did the survival, we did the uh, reporter, and we did the gene activation. And in all cases, we can see that the lack of food 
either by mutation or by removing the food, rescue this ability to activate the stress response. Okay, so this is an example of an environment of factors that you think you control, but you realize in retrospect that you weren't controlling. And sometimes you, you don't really think that something as simple as having 10 worms versus 20 worms will have such a big impact on your system. And uh, I can uh, assume that some people didn't notice that. Um, in fact, I think one of the most interesting aspects in the research st study is that if the parents of the parents were starved in your incubator, it could actually impact the result of the experiments that you're getting today. This is wonderful work by Oded Rechavi from Tel Aviv University. Meaning that not only do you have to control what you're giving those worms, you have to also control the ancestors. And one of the things that I really insist in my lab is that you take care and each experiment, you have to go back two or three generations to make sure that the worms lived in a perfect condition because stress can alter, and memory of stress can alter the response. And I think it's very important to pay attention to that. So the second aspect that I want to talk about is genetic factors that contribute to a specific phenotype. And I'm going to talk about genetic background, and this is really a problematic one, genetic interaction, which is... Uh, sort of a, a, a small situation of a genetic background, and then genetic drift. I hope I can get to all of them. Please tell me if I'm running late. Okay, so this is the same experiment, but this is a sort of a, a fast forward a few years later. We were looking at a modifier, genetic modifier, called LIPL4. And that, that modifier was changing the way the response was occurring, and we order a strain from a different lab, and they send us a strain where the modifier was expressed, but not in all, uh, all organisms. So it will be uh, um, inherited randomly. Some animals will have it, some animals will not. Okay? So uh, you assume that the best control for an experiment is animals from the same genetic background that don't have it versus do have it, and to see what happens. And we did the experiment, and indeed we got the uh, collapse of proteostasis as we would expect in this particular strain. But then when we did the control of day one, where everything's supposed to be okay, my student comes to me and say, there is a problem. And they are now collapsing on the first day of adulthood. What should we do? So I said, first, look, we have used 10, 20 different, different strains that all collapse on the second day of adulthood. Something must be wrong here. And so we started by doing a very simple uh, inheritance experiment. We took the uh, wild type, sort of, put them with our wild type, um, uh, uh, separated the progeny and looked at the collapse at the first day. And what we found is that quarter of the progeny were, uh, were actually uh, collapsing on the first day, suggesting that this is a Mendelian inheritance of a recessive gene. So the gene is there, and some of the population has, uh, um, or, or this population have a, a double mutation in it that is in the background. We send it to sequencing, we actually found the gene, and when we did the experiment with the genes that we got from, uh, from uh, the CGC that uh, sends us or deposits the strains in C. elegans, with the mutation, we got the same phenotype. So this is a wild type strain that was growing in the lab that had some kind of a mutation occur, probably not relevant to a lot of other things. They didn't even know it's in the background. But in our case, it changed the way the, the result looked like. And uh, as I said, we always confirm things, so we also did it using an, a different method, RNAi, to knock down the genes not by mutation, and we looked at the activation of a reporter to see it, exactly the system. So genetic background, as I said, could be a huge problem because we usually use sequencing what will be called under the lamp. So <coughs> we know there is a mutation, we sequence the mutation. We don't sequence the rest of the genome. We don't know exactly what's there. We assume that it's similar and we assume that there are not big changes and this assumption needs to be tested from time to time. Uh, this is why I usually backcross things into my N2 background and uh, the, the, the wild type background, sorry, <laughs> and I use a lot of time more than one wild type background to check if I, if I can and also uh, replace the worm from time to time. All are good practices to maintain uh, or avoid uh, genetic uh, mistakes. The next example I want to give is actually from the literature, and I think it's a, a, a you probably don't know the, exa the example specific, but you for sure heard the repercussion of some of this, in the sense that all of you probably heard one time or another that if you want to link lo link, live long, you need to drink uh, uh, red wine. And you need to drink red wine because they're uh, uh, resveratrol, and 
this is a very important molecules that can extend your lifespan. And the reason it's a, such a very important uh, molecule is it's because it's affecting the activity of an enzyme called SIRT, SIRT2, uh, SIRT2 which is uh, supposedly extending lifespan. Why do I say supposedly? <laughs> because there is a lot of literature showing that it extends lifespan, and then there is literature that just says that it does not. And while it's obviously affecting a lot of aspects of aging, you have to be very careful. And I think one of the most important things about being careful is it, uh, about this particular area is how quickly it transition into not medical, but consuming uh, products and selling the uh, general audience things that can extend their lifespan in the sense being assuming that nobody will ever sue you because nobody would live that long. <laughs> By the time you chose that it's you died, you can't really sue, right? So <laughs> it's sort of like the perfect, uh, it's the perfect sch uh, scheme uh, <laughs> Uh, area and this is why I'm very very careful when it comes to uh, looking at uh, longevity modifiers and uh, consumer beware let's say okay so this is an example from a, uh, from a study in C. elegans I am not showing you all the data there is also uh, yeast there is also <coughs> flies and data controversy in both in, in most of those animals let's say it like this uh, so this data, what it shows, it, it's a lifespan curve, meaning we are asking how many uh, of the population is still alive. You start with 100%, you follow how many died, and uh, you basically ask when is the last animal dying, okay? Uh, and so the, the typical N2, if you grow it at around uh, 20 degrees, it's, it's approximately three <coughs> weeks for median lifespan. Um, and then what they had is they had an extra chromosomal array meaning expressing something, but not everyone expressing it, of this gene, SIR2. And when they did it, you can see that the arrays all extend lifespan. There were different extents, but they were all doing that. And then the next thing they did is uh, integrated uh, those trains into the genome. So now it's stably inherited to the other generation. And you can see that there is one strain here that really substantially extend lifespan. As I said, there's data from other sources and so on, and this has been uh, in the literature for a while, and a lot of people trying to reproduce, reproducing, and so on, this, this information. But then came this paper 10 years later, and I actually have to say that I, I, I really appreciated the fact that this was published in Nature 2, and this was a very careful work by a lot of different labs showing the absence of effect of CR2 on expression of lifespan in two systems, C. elegans and Drosophila. So uh, normally uh, negative data would not be published, definitely not in nature, but this, in this case it was. And so what you can see here is that they have shown that the CR2 extend the lifespan, okay? But then they cross it out. So meaning they took a wild type, as I suggested uh, or, or explained before, cross it several times, and follow the gene, not the phenotype, okay? And when they did that, the SIR2 that was backcrossed, so it's genetically a mutation in SIR2, but it's no longer extending lifespan, okay? It's back here. They uh, then found in the background a different mutation. It's a mutation uh, affecting neuronal function, and this particular mutation is known to affect lifespan, and they were able to get that mutation separate, and they were able to show that the lifespan goes with that mutation. So basically there was a background mutation here too, like we showed before. And the background mutation was the one that was giving the phenotype. And if you did your experiments by following up the phenotype, okay, anytime you cross two strains, you made sure that the phenotype remained, then you would say that it's extending lifespan. But in, in a sense, it wasn't because it was the other mutation or a, a, hiding, a hidden mutation in the background that was giving you this phenotype. <coughs> This, of course, have repercussion in many different ways. Um, this was answered, I am not going to show you, by the author of the original paper, claiming that they redid it and it's still showing 10% uh, extension of lifespan. Uh, I would leave it to you to argue. Uh, another another uh, example is this. Uh, people in worms work with worms. I said that one of the advantages is you have one worms and you have 200 worms is amazing, it's really cool. It means that you don't have to cultivate the animals all the time, but one really big um, uh, disadvantage of this is that uh, when you have one worm on a plate and you want to look at that worm three days later there are 200 worms there 
And so you can tell the difference in the beginning because one is big and the others are small, but then of course the other grows and then it becomes really impossible to know which was the experiment worm and which are the progeny. And this is really important when you do a lifespan experiment because now you want to look at 20 something days and you want to look at a lot of different uh, condition and a lot of worms and you cannot, or it's very hard and rigorous to do it when you have to, you have to separate the, the mother from the progeny all the time. And so people find shortcuts and one of the shortcuts is a, is a drug called FUDR and when you use FUDR, you basically block the production of progeny. Very uh, uh, popular in uh, lifespan experiment, and you can see that it, 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 its application is, was justified in showing that when you take the wild type and you do all this manipulation and use different concentration, you do not see change in lifespan. They live the same. But then someone did experiment with a, a different mutation. This one is affecting the mitochondria function. And uh, if you do the experiments under normal condition and you move the worms from the progeny and you are very careful, then you see that this mutation shortened the lifespan, substantially, okay? But if you then go, so compare this one that lives like around 12 days to this one that lives like around 20 in median lifespan. But then if you put uh, now FUDR, this, this, this strain now leaves twice the amount of wild type does, and you would assume that this is a gene that actually contributes to extended lifespan, which is completely reverse from what this uh, gene actually is doing. So this again, um, uh, sort of precaution to think about genetic background, genetic interaction, and things that are occurring in when your experiment that sometimes you are not considering. And even if it's a common practice, sometimes you need to pay attention to uh, uh, the properties. Okay, I'm going to give two really quick uh, uh, other example of genetic interaction, genetic drifts. Those are more example to think about. Do I have to finish? Five minutes. Okay, excellent. So I will do it in like two minutes. Just to say that those things happen, I'm actually not giving uh, something that didn't work. So this is a genetic background. Geneticist knows very much about genetic interaction. I showed you some genetic interaction when there was, we didn't know that there was a mutation in the background. What I want to add here to this genetic interaction is the fact that genetic interaction is not constant all the time. It could actually change with the organism age, tissue, behaviors, and those are things that you want to look at. So for example, if we looked at the effect of this mutant on this mutant here, we would not necessarily say that it's uh, experimentally uh, different. They are behaving quite similarly. But if you look at the first day of adulthood, the, the difference is quite striking. Okay? And you can see the difference also in the molecular level. So the fact that you tested at one time or another is not always a control, and I know there is, a, <laughs> there is an end to controls that you can do, but those are things that you need to sort of consider when you're looking at a phenotype, uh, the fact that there could be interactions that are specific to a time and place. Uh, the other things I want to give is, is, is one of the, uh, uh, our last publication and really exciting in the sense that uh, figuring out was, uh, was really interesting. And, and, uh, and I think it's an interesting <coughs> phenomenon we don't usually consider in, when you follow genetic changes. So in this, in this uh, particular experiment, we crossed two strains, and we got uh, the mutant, and we got the wild type. And this particular strain also have defective mitochondria in the background. Okay? And we did the experiment, and we could see that we get the phenotype, and it's quite striking. And then uh, we looked at the uh, progeny of two generation later, and the uh, uh, phenotype completely disappeared. Okay, so this was really weird. So we started doing very carefully monitoring each and every step, and this is what we found. The first generation, you have a strong phenotype, and this phenotype disappears. On the second generation, third generation, fourth generation, you can also see it here, and developmental phenotype. Worms barely make it to adulthood, but then the next generation seems to be fine. So what happened? Now when you look at this, what you realize that for whatever uh, underlying mechanism was actually clearing out the defective mitochondria. There was a selection going, uh, going on here. And basically what we had is that the animals that we were testing in generation three and four were very different from the generation one and two because generation one and two still had defective mitochondria in the background, generation three and four no longer had it, okay? And so, uh, again, one of the things that I, I want to say is that you have to, in experimental system, pay very careful um, attention to, the, um, to, to the, your system and how it's behave and really to um, get to know it. Okay, so a few concluding things. First, use robust phenotype. 
and explore different <laughs> experimental conditions. Don't just use one and, and you know, be open to changes. Check and check again, to error is human. Okay, we make mistakes. The biggest problem is, is sort of uh, continuing with the mistake or not fixing it. So you have to find them and you have to, uh, to do the best you can in terms of removing the mistake or owning your mistake. Uh, use different methods, different tools, different genetic background to explore a system. Don't use one way. The more different tools you use, the more likely you are to find a mistake. If it is or a mistake or a problem in the system that you are not expecting. Look at the raw data and then look again because the raw data can tell you a lot of things that the um, analyzed data cannot. Uh, carefully report on experimental procedure. And this I got from my uh, PhD supervisor, and it's the way I believe in doing science is that the data is the sovereign. What the data says is what we are sort of taking as interpretation and how we follow uh, the result. We might have hypothesis and moment of glory when we are right, but for the most part, the data is right. So we need to listen to the data. And that's it. Uh, thank you for listening. Sorry for... <laughs> Within your lab and uh, molecular cell biology, questions. Okay, I was either very clear. Or <laughs> you were yeah. very clear. Okay, thank you. First of all, I really like your uh, lecture, and also the subject is very popular in recent recently years. The uh, uh, thing of stopping aging. So I wanted to ask for your opinion. How do you when you talk to the general public? So, <laughs> How much of, like, you cannot report all the caveats in your own work, right? When you talk, talk to all the... All the yeah, so, so, so you know, this is the funniest thing is that... Listening. So, where do you draw the line, right? Because I know there is at least one person, and that you know, that wrote a book about it, that he really sells it, right? It really There's a lot of people that sell it. A lot of people make like, um, money out of aging. So, what do so, you do? Well, I have to say, th th this reminds me of a very interesting experience where I was invited to give a talk in the elderly house. And I started to talk about this, and someone stopped me and said, you know, if it's not relevant to me, I don't really care. <laughs> it's like, tell me how this extends my life. So I usually say when people ask, I say, look, I can extend uh, worm's life. If you're not a worm, I'm not going <laughs> to give you any, any uh, medical <laughs> advice. <laughs> Some of the principle we find in worms can uh, be found, of course, in other motor organisms. Other we would, otherwise, we would not use them. Uh, but... Uh, we are obviously not a worm, and things are becoming more complex. So, for example, dietary restriction is one of the, I know there are a lot of people are running with this diet in, in intermittent fasting and so on. There's a lot of literature showing that this is correct and it's impacting uh, different animals. But then when you look, at the, you look at the data, the more complex the organism, the less clear the, the data becomes. So it's not that it's not necessarily correct, it's just that the complexity of the system and metabolism regulation becomes harder to actually tell what is exactly the impact. So what I try to say is that I try to say that I'm, I'm talking about principle and I want to explain biological principle and I hope that one day some of the things that I find will you know, be related to uh, uh, changing in medical, but right now what my main focus is to understand the, the, <laughs> the system and how it works, how it thinks, what exactly it's doing. Okay, thanks. We have another question um, from Uta. Yeah, briefly, I understood that um, you consider the experiments which showed that CIR1 does not extend life are more reliable than those that show the opposite, right? Yeah. I find that very sad, but it has to be accepted. <laughs> and uh, second, you said data is the sovereign, but I showed before the cases where data were True. misleading. True. So you have to go also into interpretation, <laughs> and data yes, alone it, it, cannot decide on anything. That is true, but uh, uh, this is where I said that sometimes we fail. Uh, and, and this is why I, um, in the end, think that we, have, we, we don't report on the proof. We report, poor, we report on the hypothesis and the um, supporting argument that we have for that hypothesis. And we always assume that there might come an argument that will make us look at the data in a different way. Uh, and uh, yeah, sometimes you think that your data is correct, like in, you can assume that uh, 
using SEER2 was originally assumed to be the correct way, okay? But then when you find a flaw in the experimental system, I think that you have to appreciate that this is a problem and then accept it. And yes, sometimes the data is not speaking clearly. <laughs> I would say it like this. It's easier when you work in a, a, a less complex system, but it's still there. It, it's a problem that you have to appreciate. Yeah. Thank you very much, Anad. Thank you. So now we have